Christ. We're living in between the knowledge of our salvation. We look forward to Easter with the knowledge that Christ died for our sins to free us from them. Um, but we're also living in this place of knowing why he had to do that, looking at our sin, looking at the darkness of the world. Um, and this is a great song to kind of help us navigate that and prepare us to celebrate Easter. So I hope you like it and sing to Jesus. I shouldn't forget to read the call to worship, though, which is from Psalm 121. Let's stand together for that. Lift up your eyes, people of God. We look to the hills. We stare into our barren deserts. We gaze at the far horizon. Where is our help? Our help is from the Lord, the one who made the heavens and the earth. We lift our eyes, lift our eyes to him and follow his ways.
you are all around us. That because you shed your blood, because of your life and death, that you are with us at, at every moment when we're walking in obedience, when we're walking in truth, also when we're, when we're disobeying, when we're um, choosing death over life. We thank you that you are here, you are with us. Um, pray that you would open our eyes to just bless the rest of the service to your name, to your kingdom. Amen. Please greet one another with the love of Christ. Thank you so much, Tim, and the worship team for leading us in that time of worship. Um, as I was just singing and worshiping God, I just thought, you know, hey, we should put all these songs on a, on a CD and uh, put them together and just give them out to people that you can, you can experience God's uh, worship. Uh, and you're the car, you're driving to work, you're at home. Would anyone be interested in that? Uh, just give me a raise of hands. All right. Okay. All right, take note. We'll talk. We'll talk about that. All right, praise the Lord. Well, as we pray, I want to thank you, those that surprised me last week with a surprise birthday party. That was uh, totally surprised um, in every way and overwhelmed with all the cards and uh the, the great food and so forth. So thank you uh, for that unexpected surprise. And uh, you know, my mom, growing up, she would never let us know how old she was. She just kept it a real secret. In fact, she got her license and whited out <laughs> her birthday. And uh, I know that because we were picked up by the police one time. Uh, we had an accident. And, and he said, driver's license and, and registration, and he passed it on. He said, what's this? You defaced the license. She said, well, it's none of your business how old I am. <laughs> and so I decided to, to go the opposite way of my mom and just celebrate every year that God gives me and just let it out there. This is how old I am. So thank you for being part of uh, that celebration. I appreciate it. Well, let's pray, and as we pray... I want to pray for John Smith. He's in Oklahoma, um, and his aunt died, and he drove the, the 30 plus hours there and 30 plus hours coming back. So we'll pray for John, uh, and uh, also want to pray for TJ, who went into the <coughs> hospital yesterday with a seizure. And so, uh, so we'll pray uh, for TJ uh, if we can do that. Um, that's uh, Katie Trailer's son, in case you want to know who TJ is. All right, so we'll do that. As you think about how to get prayer requests to us, you can simply write them on the cards and put them in this basket right here. I know there's some right there. You can call up Sherry in the office, and she'll put them on the prayer chain. Or you can hand me notes as you come to church. Uh, whatever works for you, we want to pray for you and pray with you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are behind and before us. You are above us and with us. And you have promised to never fail us or forsake us. And to go with us always, even to the end of the age. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for that abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for the time of worship here at Trinity Church each Sunday, where we experience the, the presence of God corporately with the body as you inhabit the praises of your people. 
We pray, Father, that we would become in growing measure men and women of praise who praise you Sunday morning, praise you Sunday afternoon, praise you in our cars and in our workplaces, who praise you with our singing, who praise you with our work and our labor and our prayers and our service. May our entire lives be a a reflection of, of thanksgiving to you for what you have done for us in sending your son Jesus to die upon the cross for our sins, to atone for our sins and to robe us with the robe of righteousness of Christ himself, whereby we can come before you crying out, Abba, Father, we've been justified, no longer condemned, but received the the grace of forgiveness for our sins. And Lord, as good as that is, you, you call us to not only be reconciled to you, but to be reconciled to others and to be available to be a minister of reconciliation in the world. So we pray, Lord, that as we worship you, you'd fill us, fill our minds with your truth, remind us of the promises of of Scripture and what you've done for us and what you are doing and will do. And may we go forth into this world as a minister, as an ambassador of yours, imploring people to be reconciled to God and receive this gift of forgiveness and reconciliation as well. Father, as we, 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 we gather here today, we want to remember a, a few of uh, uh, your people. We pray for TJ. Uh, we pray for him that's in the hospital and uh, had this seizure. Um, and now uh, he has pneumonia and starting him on antibiotics. And Father, we, we, we pray for him in the ICU. Uh, in this uh, sedated state, and we lift up uh, uh, this, this son of, of Katie. We thank you, Lord, that we can pray together for him, pray for your divine hand of healing, guide and direct the hospital staff, uh, and use them as ministers of yours. And we pray, Lord, that you would sovereignly work, not only physically, but spiritually in his life, that you'd speak to him even in his unconscious state, speak to him in a a dream or vision, and may he see, Jesus, that you died upon the cross for his sins. May he know that you love him, and we pray, Father, for a sovereign move of your Holy Spirit in T.J.'s life. We pray for John Smith. Thank you for his ministry with us as, as the sexton of his church. We pray for him as he is uh, driving back uh, soon from Oklahoma from the funeral of his aunt. We pray for John that you'd comfort him in the loss of of this family member and that you would be with him as he drives and and, uh, be with his family and care for them during his absence. And Father, we pray for anyone here today that is seeking to hear your voice more clearly. Lord, we pray that you would open the ears of our hearts, that we would hear you speaking to us, applying scripture to us individually as well as corporately, and that when we hear your voice speaking through the preaching of your word, through the words or the the kind touch of another person, or through circumstances, that we would stand back and say, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. What you said, I will do, and step out in faith and obey. So, Lord, teach us what it means to walk by faith and to be your sheep that hear your voice and to obey you. Hear us now as we pray together the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Well, as uh, Bill comes to minister to us in song, I'd like to read from Psalm 62. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and salvation. He's my fortress. I will not be shaken. 
My salvation and honor depend on God. He is my mighty, my mighty rock and my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him. Our God is a refuge. As we give, it is an expression of pouring out our hearts to God, saying, I trust in you. I trust in you. So let's show that in our giving today. my heart was full of sin and shame till someone told me Jesus came to save when he said come unto me he set my poor heart free for me to live his Christ who died Mark, would you lead us in our prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful for uh, who you are as revealed in your Son. And Lord, truly, uh, everything that we, we have in this world, it's, it's worthless compared to what we have in your Son. So Lord, we ask that you would take uh, some of what we have in this world and that you would just use that, multiply it out for your glory. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. And it's in your son's name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Please join me in the privilege of reading the word of God. Our first reading will be in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 19, 8 through 18, and that can be found in your pew Bible on page 559. Again, that's 1 Kings 19, 8 
through 18. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king of Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nishmi, king of, over Israel. And anoint Elijah, son of Jephat, from Abel, Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve seven thousands in Israel all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. Our gospel reading is Matthew 16, 21 to 26, and that can be found on page 1,524. That's Matthew 16, 21 to 26. Jesus predicts his death. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would, come, anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The New Testament reading is Acts 9, 10 through 22, and that can be found on page 1,706. That's Acts 9, 10 through 22. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. 
Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All of those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for reading God's word today. Let's pray as we get ready to hear uh, from the Lord through the preaching of his word. Father, thank you for this opportunity to hear you again, and I ask that uh, I would be faithful in preaching all that you've laid upon my heart for your people, and that you'd give us all ears to hear what you have for us to hear, and that we would respond with faith and with obedience to it. For we give you all thanks and glory in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, I have a question I'd like to ask you to ponder as we get started here. And Are you one of the Lord's flock, one of his chosen members of his household? Would you say that you are in that category? Some say yes. Some of you are considering becoming a member of the flock of God. And that, too, is a very good thing. And so you're coming a little different direction than from some of the others here, and, and you're kind of watching and testing to say, is this really for me? Is this Christianity for real? Could I embrace it, or is it just a bunch of hooey? Well, there's a promise in Scripture for those who are believers and those who are considering becoming believers, and that is from the lips of Jesus. She, he said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. What a great promise that if we are his sheep, we'll know the voice of the Lord and we'll hear him and we will follow him all the days of our life. Well, last week we took up this question then, how can we know the voice of the Lord? How can we know what, it, what he sounds like? Is it just an audible voice or is it something more? And just to, just to uh, recap a little bit from last week to build a foundation on where we're going today, we explored several passages of Scripture from both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we saw that hearing and listening to the Lord's voice is something that, we can, be, that can be learned and cultivated as we grow in our faith. As you start out as a young Christian, you may think you're hearing the Lord's voice and make a lot of mistakes, sort of like a toddler who's just learning to walk, is going to trip and fall. That's just the way it is in the Christian life. Secondly, we saw that we are to take the, the standard of Scripture as, as a plumb line to measure against what we think God is saying to us and say, does that line up with God's Word or not? And guess what? If it doesn't line up with the Scripture, what has to be thrown out? Not the Bible, but what we think, we thought, God was saying to us, God's word is like a plumb line. We saw thirdly that we can learn from how to hear the Lord's voice through men and women in scripture and through church history. That there's many examples of those that heard the Lord's voice and uh, very effectively we can learn from their mistakes as well as, as their successes. And we looked at young Samuel and how that he, as, even as a boy, cried out, Lord, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Even a child can hear the Lord's voice if they're listening to, to God. We saw also in Luke 6 the supreme example of Jesus who himself went away for an all night in prayer to pray on the mountain. Why? He wanted to hear the Father's voice. And so he sought and he waited and specifically God the Father spoke to his son and said, these are the 12 people I want you to be my apostles. And he listed them. These are the 12. Now go down there and tell them I've chosen them for this role as an apostle. So Jesus did. So he listened for the voice of the Father. 
we also reflected upon the fact that when we hear the Lord's voice, it's not usually an audible voice, but most often a, a, a deep, uh, res resounding, beckoning call, an inner conviction which wells up in our minds and hearts, which oftentimes is markedly different than the way we normally think. We say, okay, this is the way I think, and suddenly, wow, this is a completely new thought. It's a holy thought. I, that must be from you because not, that's not the way I normally would handle the situation. So we looked at that. Well, when we obey him and look back in the rearview mirror, we'll be able to see with 2020 vision, was that really the Lord speaking to us or did we just convince ourselves that it was? We also gave examples from scripture and personal experience in hearing the Lord's voice sometimes through dreams and visions, and sometimes God will even correct us uh, through a dream if we're listening to him. Well, that's some of the foundational teachings from last time. Let's build on that uh, for today. In the book of 1 Kings 19, we read the story of this prophet Elijah. He's fleeing from the wicked queen Jezebel. Uh, she is threatened to kill him as a prophet of God, and so he's hiding out in Horeb, Mount Horeb, in a cave. Doesn't sound like something that a courageous man of God would do. But even a courageous man like Elijah, that before was on Mount Carmel, and he had he'd taken on the Baal gods, and, and he called upon God, and God answered with fire. Even he can have moments of, of despair and discouragement and fear. So no matter how strong you are in your faith, all of us have times like that, and this was Elijah's time. Well, he goes away, and the Lord instructs Elijah to stand and wait for his presence to pass by. And the Bible says a great powerful wind which tore the mountain apart, shatters the rocks, appears. But guess what? The Bible says, but God was not in that wind. And then it says an earthquake is seen and felt by Elijah. And sometimes God manifests himself through these kind of phenomena. But God was not in the earthquake. And then it says a fire. And there's many examples in scripture in which God appears in fire. Uh, can you think of one? I didn't hear you because you all spoke at the same time. All right. Okay. Example of fire. How about when God spoke to Moses, the burning bush, about leading the Israelites to the wilderness? What did he appear as? Help me out. Pillar of fire. Thank you. Pillar of fire. All right. At Pentecost. Great. Flames of fire over the head. All right. We're just warming up. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, in this case, the Lord did, was not in the fire. He was in those other cases, but in this case, he was not in. But then the Bible says a gentle whisper and the still small voice of God uh, and speaks to Elijah, asking him, what are you doing here? What are you hiding out in this cave for? Why are you here? And he, the answer is why. He's afraid Jezebel is going to kill him. and He's the only one left. I'm the only one who's faithful to you as a prophet. Everyone else is, is dead. Well, God speaks to him in this whisper and, and corrects him and said, No, you're not. I reserve 7,000 others, men and women in Israel, that have not bowed the knee to Baal or kissed him in worship. And I'm going to call you to go back and anoint these specific men to be kings. And he gives them by name. And he says, And furthermore, there's a now a successor for you. His name is Elisha, and you go and anoint him because your job is now complete. I'm now going to select someone else, and he selects Elisha to continue this work. Well, it's, it's a great example, and, and this is the first major point of our sermon today in hearing the Lord's voice. God speaks to his people through a gentle whisper, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Are you listening? Are you listening to the voice of God as a gentle whisper, sometimes speaking to you, this is what I want you to do. This is who you are. This is your mission. This is, this is my marching orders for you. 
I want you to go forth in faith. He does. He wants to speak to us in these ways. Give me an ex- let me give you an example, another example in Scripture of this, this principle. In Acts 8, 29, the Bible says, The Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Now that's very specific. The Spirit said to him, I want you to go up and join this man who's in a chariot. And and I love this in a lot of ways because when God speaks to us, sometimes it's that specific. But he doesn't give us the whole picture. He he doesn't say, do this, and then that'll happen, then that'll happen. He just says, here's your first step. All right? Just like a scroll. Let me unroll the scroll, and the first part of that is to go up and stand beside this chariot, and I'll fill you in on the rest as you go. Anyone have that experience with the Lord? That he, he said, all right, this is what I want you to do. And you, all right, a few. All right, some, are, some aren't sure where I'm going with this. All right, that's all right. Well, when he says this, it's a test. Will we obey the simple command? If so, there's more to come after that. So we find that Philip goes up and he joins the chariot. He obeys the voice of the Lord speaking to him. And there he sees that this man is reading from a passage from Isaiah, actually Isaiah 53. And he reads about, in Isaiah, about this one who would be crucified, this one who would be slain, the one that that would be uh, lifted up. And and he says, who is this speaking of? And then uh, God speaks to, through Philip and said, tell him who it is. It's Jesus. So he tells him all about Jesus. And this man accepts Christ and is baptized uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. A wonderful example of listening to the voice of God. And then the Bible says, and the Spirit took up Philip and took him off. Took him somewhere else. His mission was done. Sometimes God will give us a mission, and it's it's a short one. But it's still an important one. That word may be just a simple word of thanks to somebody and you say that was a short mission but don't don't think about that as not important because maybe that's exactly what it's a turning point in that person's life will will they go and obey God or they turn away from the Lord and he wants to speak through you and through me to them Uh, so we see this well hearing God's voice is a book written by Henry and Richard Blackaby and uh They say that God speaks personally, progressively, uh, consistently, and faithfully. And I want to give a quote from this uh, father-son combo in writing this book. They said together, God is on a mission to redeem a lost world. His purposes are to, uh, to draw us to himself and to help us to become increasingly more like his son. When he speaks, it is against this backdrop. Therefore, when we seek to promote ourselves or when we ask God to make our plans successful, we will not always hear what we want to hear in response. Isn't that true? When he says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to speak to you, it's not always the stamp of approval on what we want him to do. Lord, bless this plan. Bless this activity. Sometimes he'll say, well, actually, I have another plan for you. I have a different plan for you. And so that is a matter of trusting in him. Well, God's ways are perfect and they're not always our ways. But let me share this principle with you. He will not, he will never ask you to do something that is unholy or breaks his commands. He'll never do that. He'll never do that. In other words, if someone says, you know, the Lord told me I'm supposed to shave my income tax and not show all of my income, so I'll have more money to give to missions. Now, that wasn't God speaking, because he doesn't use dishonorable methods to accomplish what he wants to do. Do you agree with that? I was in Uganda some years ago, 2001 to be exact, and I was having trouble getting a ticket to go to Kenya. And someone said to me, you know your problem, David, down here we bribe people. 
So if you want to get a ticket, you got to give Greece the palm of the person, basically. Give them a little something or another. And I went to one checkpoint, and, and the one guy was said, well, I'm sorry, I can't let you through. Uh, this problem with your paperwork. And I went, oh, well, what's the problem? He said, well, you know, this wasn't quite filled out right, but, you know, and waited for a bribe. And I went, oh, okay, well, what's, what's in order? He looked at me like, don't you get it? <laughs> I'm waiting for a little payback here. And he says, well, you know, why don't you just do something for me, like buy me lunch, and then we'll be able to bring you through. Well, I was not real, real, real uh, clever about these things. And I said, sure, I'm happy to buy you lunch. And I, I said, what does the lunch cost? And he went, well, whatever you want to give would be good. I said, all right, well, I had something. I said, would this help you, get, help you get a meal? And I thought the poor guy really needed some help. And then afterwards, I'm into the country of Kenya, and, and suddenly it breaks this Revelation says, David, you just gave the guy a bribe. I went, oh my goodness, I need to go back and take it back from him. Well, it was too late. Well, God never leads you that way. He doesn't lead you to bribe someone. He doesn't lead you to do something immoral or dishonoring to him. So you can always recognize this isn't God speaking. This is something else, the spirit of the world or yourself or, or others. Second principle, God speaks not only through his, his still small voice, but God speaks through the church, his body of believers. How many, with just a, a raise of a hand, would say God spoke directly to you through another person? Could you raise your hand? All right, keep them up. All right, look around. All right, you can put your hands down. God spoke through another person. That's one of the ways that he works. So when we say, hear your voice, Lord, it's not just about me going away on a mountaintop and listening for God. That's something that we can do. But many times he wants to speak to us through another brother or sister in Christ. Now give me an example from Scripture, David. Glad to. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Now here we find that the Apostle Paul has just received this, the risen Christ himself who appeared to him. Now that's a great way to hear from God. If Christ himself appears to you and speaks to you, you say, I heard a, voice, I heard a word from the Lord. Really, he did. But you know, God also spoke to the Apostle Paul through visions and through dreams. But he also spoke to him through other members of the body of Christ. There is this man named Ananias. And he has a vision and God said to him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Very specific, not general knowledge. Go to this house, to this man's name. You'll find a man named Saul of Tarsus. He's praying He's seen in a vision a man named Ananias that's going to come. Go to this man. He's my chosen instrument to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Place your hands on him and heal him. And so Ananias comes. He lays his hands upon him for healing, and he speaks forth God's word to him. Ananias is that person through which the Lord speaks to Saul. Now, what's, what's the, the point here? The point is you can be the Apostle Paul and still God will speak to you through another person. So don't think you're so spiritually minded. You don't need anyone else. That's when we get ourselves in a danger zone. People will say, I don't need the church. I've got me and the Holy Spirit. That's all I need. I'm going to go off and, and not attend a church, not be part of a, of a fellowship of his people. It's just me, my Bible, and the Lord. That's all that I need. You're in a great danger zone. Because many times, not only in a danger zone, you're also in a place that you're limiting what God really wants to say to you through others because you're cutting them out of your life. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 
Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God uses us, and he pleads through us to others. Now, I've got three or four examples here, and I'm going to choose one for the sermon. And if you want to hear more, I can give you more after, afterwards. There was a man named George, George Truett. He was a talented and promising young man, and his plan was to become a lawyer. He was active in his church. In fact, he was the Sunday school superintendent of his church. And one day, an elderly deacon arose and made a motion. Now listen to this motion made. He says, I move that we ordain George Truett to the gospel ministry. And immediately another person said, I second it. And he went, wait a minute now. What do I have to say about that? And, and he says, I don't want to go into the gospel ministry. Uh, I want to be a lawyer. And uh, they said, no, we, we feel God clearly speaking through us that God is calling you to the gospel ministry and you need to obey. And he said, well, let's have six months that I can think about that and pray about that. And the body said, no, we will not delay six hours. If we delay six hours, we are disobedient to the Holy Spirit. You must be, be ordained to the gospel ministry and not become a lawyer. Can you imagine that? We, he, he says, okay. He listens. He sees and he hears that God is speaking through the body. And who is he to deny the fact that God was speaking there? Well, he went on to, to, to become the pastor of First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, in 1897. There's a very stern picture of him here, but he was a very godly man, a very scholarly man. Uh, and he also became the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, 1927 to 29. Tremendous example of a God, of a man that God called through the body. Reminds me a little bit of, of my calling to the pastorate. I was 26 years old. Nothing like that, fortunately. Uh, <laughs> nothing that dramatic. But it still was God speaking through the body nonetheless. I was preaching in a little church called Wharton Furnace Chapel in Chalkill, Pennsylvania. And the people said, we feel that God is calling you to the pastoral ministry. And I said, well, he'll have to tell me before I change my course. And I went to another church in Connellsville, Pennsylvania. They said, we feel God's calling you to the pastoral ministry, and we want you to be our pastor. I went, sorry, I'm not trained. I'm not interested. I don't think I want that headache. No, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, and they said, well, we, we really feel that. Well, then the pastor, uh, Alex Ufema, said, David, God's calling you to the pastoral ministry. You need to answer that call. And I said, I'm sorry. He's going to have to tell me about that. I'm just not hearing it. And I spent, uh, I didn't have the luxury. I, I did have the luxury, not like George Truett, in which I could say, I'm going to spend some time to pray about it. Well, after a period of a year, it became obvious to me that God was speaking to me to, to go into the pastoral ministry, but he was speaking all along through the body, and I just wasn't hearing it. Sometimes God wants to speak to you through the body. Listen, don't write them off. Perhaps God has a word for you, and, uh, and consider it. Now, let me give you... Well, here's a, here's a scripture for you, Proverbs 11, 14. We'll put that one up at this time, if you would, gentlemen. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. There is safety. Other people, godly men and women, can confirm this is truly God speaking, and we need to hear that to confirm his calling. Now, Sometimes God is not speaking through another person. And Satan is speaking through that person. And an example for that is from Matthew 16. That was our gospel reading. And the case here is Jesus has heard from the Father that he is to go to Jerusalem and there he's going to die upon the cross for the sins of humanity. And this was the plan of God. This was God's call for him. 
And he announces this to his disciples, and Peter says to him, no, never, Lord, this will never happen to you. I oppose this. This is not from God. It's, it's the wrong direction. And, and here we see that, that Jesus recognizes that it's not the voice of the Holy Spirit through, speaking through Peter. In this case, it was Satan trying to, to, to dissuade him to another course. Sometimes when God calls us to do something that's very risky, that may involve financial hardship, that may involve a risk to our health, those within our family or close friends may say, don't do it. Don't do it. We have to recognize that their motivation is they don't want to see us hurt, they don't want to see us suffer, so their hearts are good. But recognize the greater multitude of people, what God is saying to do and to listen to them. Example for me personally is when uh, I felt God calling Susan and I, our family, to go to Uganda. Well, this was a major decision, and I needed to know God was really speaking. I didn't just have some, some uh, pork and sauerkraut the night before and had some kind of indigestion thing and some dream and it had nothing to do with God. It was just something I ate. So I said, I need to know for sure this is God that is speaking. And so uh, after doing that, I went to the elders, and they all prayed, and they said, yes, this, this is from the Lord. You need to go. And I said, but how about the flock? Who's going to care for the flock while we're gone for this three months? Well, a man stepped forward and his wife, and they said, we will preach the gospel, and we will carry this work forward free of charge. Well, you know, the, the finance committee said, praise the Lord. <laughs> this, is what, this has to be from God. Someone to come to preach the gospel of the caliber of a Douglas and Eileen Crossman, free of charge. This is from God. So they were behind it. And then I said, but how about the school teachers in Douglas, high, Douglas uh, school system? They won't be behind pulling our kids out of the public schools. So let's see what they have to say. So we contacted the, 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 the teachers there, and the teachers said, go. It's wonderful. We think they'll get a great education, so we're behind it. So suddenly uh, the church is behind it, the elders are behind it, everyone's behind it. And then I announced it to my family, uh, mom and dad, they said, this is not from God. I'm there, why not? You might get hurt, and you may get AIDS, and you may, who knows what's going on in that country, in Uganda. Stay here in America where it's safe. And I had to, to look at the counsel I received at all different corners, and what God was saying to me through Scripture, through others, and, and, and through my parents, and not discount any of it. And look at it all together and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? Are they right? Are, are my parents right? I want to be open to the fact that they're right and everyone else is wrong. I need to be open to that. But I really prayed and the Lord said, David, the safest place you can be is in the center of my world. So I shared that with my mom. I said, Mom, I love you. I know you don't want me to get sick. I don't want to get sick. I, I, I know you, don't, you want our family not to be at risk. I don't want my family at risk. But I feel if God is calling us to Uganda, the safest place to be is not in Massachusetts right now, but in Uganda, in the center of his will. Would you agree with that? And she said, I agree with you, David. I changed my vote. <laughs> I think you should go. In fact, I'm going to talk to my church. And the whole church in Lebanon came behind us, and they were a major supporter for us to go. Now, there's no question that God was in that. Then when we got there, and the whole thing fell apart, and the teaching that we're supposed to do didn't materialize like they said it was, it was like, now what? I didn't have to second guess, was God in this because all the other things were lining up? So I said, God has another plan, and he did. 
raised up a man, Wynne Hurlburt from African Resource Ministry, and I had three months of teaching across the country, and God blessed it. He blessed it. So listen. Listen to the body. Listen to what they have to say. God may be speaking directly to you through them. Well, the third principle. God speaks through the preaching of his word. Not only uh, to the reading of his word, but through someone that is preaching. Romans 10 says this, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can someone preach unless they are sent? You see, sometimes God speaks to us through the sermon, through the preaching of his word. Listen, listen. So when you come to a sermon, don't say, oh, I like that, I didn't like that. This was a good illustration, that was lousy. That one he used ten times before. He needs some new material, which is probably true, by the way. But don't be, don't be doing that. Say, Lord, what are you saying to me through the preaching of your word today? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I want to, to listen, and I want to obey. God raises up preachers who will be his mouthpieces of grace and forgiveness from sins. One of the major means and vehicles through which he sovereignly chooses to bless and use. One day, a famous preacher from the 19th century named Charles Spurgeon, he preached in London, England, and he was called to preach at the age of 19. God used him over the course of his life, and, and uh, the church grew to about 5,000 people. Uh, and one time, Charles Spurgeon he was extremely dry, he was worn out, he was discouraged. And his, in his own words, he said, I felt like a waiter at a, at a wedding feast, longing to be a guest at the Lord's table. Yeah, you know, I'm always giving. I'm always giving out. And, and, and I'm feeling dry, and I'm feeling what's there for me. So he was deeply moved. Well, he, he felt this feeling of self-pity, and he said, I'm going to leave the pastoral ministry and going to travel somewhere else until I hear from the Lord. Uh, I just, I'm not hearing from him. Well, one day he went to a small Methodist chapel, and the local pastor preached a sermon. And he felt God was speaking directly through that pastor. He said, wow, this is a word from God for me. This is a word, and I thank God. And, and afterward, he talked to the, the pastor and said, thank you for that message that was just, I felt God himself speaking directly through you. Thank you for your preparation. Thank, uh, thank you for what you've done. I'm truly blessed and renewed. Well, the pastor was very impressed that he would get such a compliment from a stranger. And he said, oh, well, thank you very much. Tell me, what's your name? And he said, uh, Charles Spurgeon. And the preacher got red-faced and stammered said, well, I guess you'll recognize that I plagiarized your sermon today. <laughs> One of your published sermons I just gave. And Charles Spurgeon said, oh, yeah, I recognized it. Yep, I, I, right away. But the Lord used it. He used it wonderfully. The Lord showed me clearly that the message that I preach are not just for the flock of God, they're for me too. They're for me. And so I'm refreshed and renewed. I don't feel like this waiter always giving and not receiving. So the message that I'm preaching is, is for my own heart, for my own soul, you see. It's a great, great word for me as well, that these messages are for me. Well, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. If you are a Christ follower, or considering becoming a Christ follower, you have this promise that God wants to speak to you. He's going to use a variety of means, certainly through Scripture, through the st still small voice of the Holy Spirit, through others, through the preaching of the Word, through dreams and visions, through nature, through other means, through ordained circumstances, and so forth, and many other things that I haven't even mentioned today. Will you listen, and will you obey? God reveals his, 
his will for us gradually, progressively, faithfully, and he calls us. He calls us to listen. Last week we had an altar call to, to hear prayer more clearly. Many of you responded to that. And I love to hear how God is answering those prayers, how you're hearing the Lord more clearly in your life. And it's something we need to pray for for one another. And when he says something, to obey him and to step out in faith and to listen. Let's stand before the Lord at this time. Before we sing, I'd like you to just be still and tune your heart to hear the still, small voice of the Lord speaking to you, a word that he wants to say to you right now, a word. Just listen. with all the voices crying out for our attention. Help us to hear your still, small voice and to harden not our hearts against you, but to say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Help us to step out in faith to obey what we feel that you are calling us to do. And speak to us through our brothers and sisters in Christ, that you would confirm that this is you clearly speaking to us. Some of us are here today wondering, is Trinity Church a church for me? Is this your call for me to be part of this fellowship? Confirm that right now, Lord. Say yes or no. Confirm it. For some, they're, they're having this, this bitterness in their life. And they need to release it. They need to be set free from it. They need to forgive that other person. Lord, Help. Send your grace to be able to forgive. Just like you forgave on the cross. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. May your grace flow through us, Lord. For others, we're, we're wondering what job it is that you have for us. Or how do we respond to this major decision in my life. Lord, give us your, your guidance, your direction. May we hear a voice, a word from God. And thank you, Lord, that we as your sheep hear your voice and you long to speak to us and through us. We ask this prayer in your name. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior.
Pray together that God would bring forgiveness for you and assurance of salvation. You come. I ask our, our prayer team to join me. If you would like to have prayer for that, please come. Or for any other reason, this is the time. We want to pray with you. Pray with you that God would break through.
place. What do we do with that? What do we do with that? Because just hearing from him is not enough. That's the first step. Then we need to step out in faith and obey him and harden not our hearts. You see. And that's why the Bible says in Hebrews, see to it that brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Encourage one another daily, as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You've come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end of the confidence we had at first. As it has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So when you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, but obey. Obey. Are you with me? So if any of you feel God's prompting you to obey and you want someone to pray with you, to help you to obey, they're here for you. They're here for you. They won't judge you. They won't criticize you. They'll just love you and pray with you. And God will help you to obey. Well, God bless you and have a great week. And go in peace.